So we're at the end of what I hope has uh, been a fruitful day for everybody. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be very short and sweet in introducing our closing keynote. Short because we're a little bit long in time, and sweet because I know Andy will have the last word if I say something wrong. Um, Andy McAfee is co-director of the IDE. Uh, he's been co-author or author of a number of award-winning books, and he's got another one on the way. And that will be largely the topic of, of today. And it's a story about tech for good, and darn it, it's about time. Andy McAfee. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here uh, once again doing mop-up duty at the end of the day. I, I'd, I'd miss all of us if we weren't here. Uh, like David says, this is the traditional way that we wrap up the CIO Symposium. And we tr I try to wrap it up by talking about something kind of big and swirly and important. So this year, it's our relationship with the planet that we all live on. And I really have trouble thinking of a bigger and broader and more important topic than that to end on. Uh, and I would all, ah, slides come up just in time. I want to tell a story about how our relationship with this world that we live on has changed. And I want to start with a guy who had some thoughts on the topic. Pop quiz time. Who is this? I'll be actually really impressed if anybody gets this one. Shout it out if you got a guess. This is? This is the Reverend Thomas Malthus, who was a cheery optimist who gave us a word Malthusium that means deeply wrong in a really gloomy way. And like we'll see, he richly deserves that reputation. But at the same time, because he said this to us, he said, oh, essentially, we're all going to starve because we keep breeding and we increase in a geometric sequence and the world's ability, Earth's ability to feed us only increases arithmetically. Do the math, everybody dies somewhere down the road. Uh, we are all proof this is not what happened. I'll show you just how wrong Malthus was. The crazy thing, though, is that he was deeply wrong about the future and weirdly insightful about the past, even though he did no historical research. People have done the historical research since Malthus's time, and I want to show you a, new, a quantitative picture of what life was like in Malthus's home country of England in the six centuries up until he published his essay on population. And what some wonderful research has allowed us to do is draw graphs of the trade-off between population and prosperity in England over the course of centuries. So here's the start of this graph. Here's what the 1200s look like in England. On the vertical axis here, we have prosperity. This is one measure. This is craftsmen's wages. On the horizontal axis, I've obliterated everything. Did I do that or can we, can we bring that back? No. Ah, on the horizontal axis, this is just the population of the dang country. How many British people were there? And you see there's this kind of trade-off throughout the 1200s. When there were fewer of them, they were wealthier. Let's see how progress unfolds from there. Here's the 1300s. Now, that's, that's not a lot better. 1400s were kind of stuck up there. 1500s, no, moving back down the curve in 1600s. Wow. Is this not progress? This is exactly the opposite. This is stasis along this Malthusian trajectory where the only time that there are more of us is when we're all less prosperous. 1700s came along, and because of agricultural improvements, things got a little bit better. We were able to increase population without sacrificing prosperity. But look at that. The average Briton in, throughout the 1700s was worse off than they were in 1200. Malthus was dead flat right about the past. And then this guy came along and changed everything. Pop quiz number two. Oh, this one's harder. If you had to pick one parent of the Industrial Revolution, who would it be? James Watt built the first economically viable steam engine and forever changed our relationship with our planet. What these technologies allowed us to do is overcome the limits of wind, water, and muscle, which were the only power sources that we humans could draw on up to that time. Thanks to Watt and all the people that followed him, we now have access to all the fossil fuels that have been stored in the Earth. And holy Toledo, did that change things. Let's keep drawing the graph of population and prosperity in England. To do that, though, we've got to add two more centuries to it. And the only way to get those centuries to fit is to shrink down everything we've already seen into that little corner of the graph. Because this is what happens in the 1800s, 
And this is what happened in the 1900s. We have never, ever witnessed anything like this. 200 years later, the population was more than five times as big, and the average population was, person was 10 times as prosperous. This is progress. This is the end of Malthusian humanity forever. I want to switch over from the UK to the US and show another consequence of this. This is the overall growth in the US economy from 1800 to 1970. And again, it's incredibly impressive. It's exponential. This was unprecedented in our history. I stopped this graph in 1970, and I want to try to show you why. Uh, and to do that, I want to add on this a line that shows what our total energy use was to generate this economy for 170 years. And when you do that, you notice a correlation of something damn close to one between these two quantities. This correlation is so tight that a lot of us made this shorthand relationship, and we started using energy use as a proxy for economic advancement. It's kind of easy to see why that, that relationship is just so incredibly tight. Let me focus in on the 20th century, just 1900 to 1970, and show you a couple other relationships. So here's GD, real GDP again, and here's our total use, our total consumption of some other important building blocks of an economy. A couple different metals and fertilizer to let us get all of that food from the earth. And you notice again, these are really tight relationships. In fact, for a couple of these resources, consumption is growing even faster at the end of this period, the 50s and 60s. It's growing even faster than our total economy was. And around 1970, a couple people became aware of this phenomenon at different levels of detail, and they kind of said, wait a minute, there is a problem here. And the problem is that this planet that we all live on, that we don't have a substitute for, it is finite. And exponential use and exponential consumption of resources, that's a thing we probably can't continue indefinitely on a finite planet. And that super tight relationship leads to kind of a scary conclusion. We can't keep growing our economy in this manner. Because if economic growth goes along one for one with all, with all this consumption, all this resource use, gang, we have a tough choice to make. And there was another round of really sunny, really optimistic writing that came, around, came out around 1970, around the time of the first Earth Day festival. And I want to share some of my favorite reading from that period. Uh, this was a really cheery book from Paul Ehrlich um, called The Population Bomb. I've never seen a book with a subtitle like this before. <clears throat> While you are reading these words, four people will have died from starvation, most of them children. It still flew off the shelves for some reason. There were people writing about how our, our technologically sophisticated free market system was just ruinous, was just going to drive us to oblivion. There was a team of modelers at MIT who produced this book in 1972. They used system dynamics and the best, the fastest computers they could get their hands on, and they built a model of the global economy that had population growth and, po and pollution and resource use and economic growth all interacting with each other, all growing. And they said, hey, uh, as far as we can tell, sometime around the middle of the 21st century, everything collapses in a way that would make Malthus look like he was lowballing the whole thing. And then finally, this is probably my favorite book title of the period. I am not sure that it needs an exclamation point, <laughs> but we got one anyway. And so there were a set of strategies that were proposed by these books and by the, the nascent environmental movement about different ways to say, look, we, we, just, we cannot keep doing this. And when I read all the recommendations, this acronym occurred to me. These were the CRIB strategies, because what we were told we had to do, had to first of all consume less, we had to recycle everything, we had to impose hard limits on stuff, and we all had to leave the cities that we lived in and our technologically sophisticated lives and go back and, and start farming the land again. We didn't do that, by the way. Um, we also, well, we did recycle, we imposed some limits, and I want to talk about that. But let's look at that first one. Did we as a whole, did we as a people, spontaneously turn our backs on affluence and prosperity growth and consumption and growing our lives and our families and our economies? This is not even a pop quiz, right? Um, here's where we were up until 1970. Here's what's happened in the years since. It is really hard to see evidence of this voluntary massive slowdown in growing our economy, becoming more prosperous. The bottom line there is our industrial production. America has always been 
or since the, about the start of the 20th century has been a manufacturing powerhouse, that has not stopped in recent years. So you really have trouble looking at our aggregate consumption and saying we walked away from this idea of just continued exponential growth. But I wanna show you what did happen to our use of resources, to our use of the planet that we all live on. And it's, I find it still a pretty wild story. Here is five metals, the history up to 1970. Voop, you see that exponential crescendo right there at the end. And that's what happened since 1970. Things kind of changed. All these metals hit a peak, they hit a plateau, and they've been declining fairly steadily since. I find it more striking to include the GDP line on this graph, to compare it to the resource use. So let's do that, and you gotta scrunch the graph down again, because you notice this profound shift, this profound decoupling from increases in our economy and our prosperity from the amount of stuff, of raw stuff we took from the earth. This is not per capita, this is total consumption by all Americans, and it includes the imports and exports of raw materials that our country does. So this is not a China story, this is not a globalization story. Let me show you a different graph. This is, again, our friend GDP versus building materials, the things we build stuff out of. Not terribly surprising that cratered after the, uh, right after the Great Recession. I'm not sure how much it will rebound. Those bottom two lines are fascinating to me, though. They are paper and timber. Our use of all of those plateaued in around 1990, and we are absolutely past peak paperwork in America. Which, which is pretty fantastic news. One more, we're gonna switch a little bit and look just at the agricultural center. The black line here is just raw tonnage of agricultural output from America's farmers all put together. We're an agricultural juggernaut. You just see that line going up very steadily. All of the inputs, except sunlight, all the inputs to agriculture have been going down. We use less fertilizer, we use less water than we did 30 years ago for agriculture in America. And that line that's gradually descending is total cropland in America. Don't let that shallow decline fool you, it adds up. Since the early 80s, we have given an amount of land back to nature equal in size to the state of Washington in America. Economically not viable, don't need it for farming, give it back, let trees grow on it. And I could show you a bunch more graphs. They all paint the same picture as I look at it. And it kind of brings up the question, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll do one more for you. Here's the graph of that formerly perfectly tight relationship between economic growth and increased energy use. That relationship has fallen apart. It has decoupled. America is 15% bigger than it was at the end of the Great Recession. We used 3% less energy than we did at the end of the Great Recession. Our carbon emissions are not falling quickly enough. Global warming is real and bad, and we have to work on it. Our carbon emissions are post-peak. I predict they'll be forever post-peak. And it brings up this fundamental question, how did we accomplish this? What miracle happened? And for an answer, we pretty clearly have to go to a Radio Shack ad from 1991. This is a true story. There was a, a newsman in Buffalo who bought a stack of 1991 physical Buffalo newspapers at a yard sale and found this Radio Shack ad for President's Day or something in them. And he had this interesting observation. He said, there are 14 items on this ad. 12 of them have disappeared into your smartphone. We just don't, how many of us have a separate camcorder that we use, home answering machines? Uh, what else we got there, compact discs? a laptop, a corded phone, a cord, no. We all just carry around a device that weighs what? A few ounces, and there, we substitute big heavy stuff for it over and over. When the first CAFE standards, the fuel emission standards for fleets were introduced, automakers, engineers had to respond to them, so they made engines that had lower horsepower. When the Obama administration put another end of CAFE standards in place, the overall efficiency went up and the average horsepower went up as well. That trade-off between the two has eased, and we are now able to make cars that are simultaneously um, more efficient, faster, 
and lighter. The average auto engine weighs about 40% less than it did a generation ago. These are all aspects of tech progress. I think the computer is the tool that actually let us save our planet. I want to give one more example. I was talking about this phenomenon a year or so ago over dinner with a, a friend of mine who's had a long and really interesting career. And he said, the very first job I had after I graduated from school was to go work for the Chicago and Northwest Railway in the late 1960s. And he said, my first assignment was to help the company figure out where all of its boxcars were. I said, huh? He said, yeah, we essentially had no idea. He said, the rule of thumb in the industry in the late 1960s was that 5% of our rolling stock actually rolled on any given day. The other 95% did not need to rest. That was not the problem. They didn't know where they were on the thousands of miles of tracks around the country. So they would actually employ people to go stand at railroad junctions, watch cars, rail cars go past. This is why they have um, codes on them. And then call or telegraph back to the home office whenever they saw one of theirs. This was the sensor network of the late 1960s in the US uh, um, railroad industry. And as my friend Bo explained to me, he said, look, it was immediately clear that if we could get that 5% up to 10%, we would need half as many of these 30-ton pieces of steel on our balance sheet. This is a total no-brainer. I don't think I have to stress that every railroad in the country now knows where all of its rolling stock is at every point in time. This inefficiency is just gone. So we're just in a very different place now. Because of these two forces working together, capital is just this ruthless competition, this desire to cut costs, a penny saved is a penny earned, this ruthless capitalism plus tech progress in the era of the computer, what Eric and I have called the second machine age, this has brought us into a different relationship with our planet, a very different relationship with our planet. It's, I find it super good news. And it leads to the question pretty quickly, great, is this the whole story? Is this all we need? Do we just keep need to be doing more capitalism, more tech, more tech progress? And the answer is an unequivocal no. This is actually really important because when you take your Econ 101 course here, the first thing you learn, the first week of classes, is that markets work and we need to let them do their stuff. The second thing you learn when you come back for, for week number two is that markets don't work to deal with externalities, of which pollution is the classic one. Factories will pollute if we don't make it costly for them to do so. So the Econ 101 playbook is let the markets work and deal with the externalities that come up. It's just a beautiful recipe for making things better. So we have to add a couple other forces here. We have to add public awareness of the, pro of the harms that we're doing this world that we live on, the problems that we're creating, and an awareness, this is what Earth Day was so good at, an awareness that we need to fix it and demands upon our government to take the action to deal with these problems, with these externalities. When you do that, when we put all four of these together, my cute label for these is instead of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, I call these the four horsemen of the optimist because they really do put us into a better place with our world. And in the years since Earth Day, man, we have done a lot of this. Not enough, we need to do more. But let's take a minute and think about things that have happened. We definitely passed a Clean Air Act and successive improvements to it. We passed a Clean Water Act, and we started saying, hey, why don't we not kill a lot of the animals that we like having around with us on the planet? Uh, we're just going to place them outside the market system. We know markets are great, blah, blah, blah. No, no, put them outside the market system. I want to end with two pictures that talk about the triumphs that we've accomplished here. I don't want us to be complacent or blasé. There's a ton more work to do. The planet is overheating. We need to stop it. But we know the playbook, and we need to actually acknowledge that we have made some, some huge strides. We've accomplished some impressive victories. This is what we used to do to whales. Um, at the start of, in about 1900, there were a couple hundred thousand blue whales on, uh, in the world's oceans, as far as we can tell. We took that down to about 200 animals to make lubricants and margarine out of them. This is a crime, right? This is, this is what we almost accomplished, and this was our relationship with whales for a while. This is how successful we've been at bringing them back. We clean up the air, we clean up the water, we put these animals outside the market system, and they show up off the shores of New York City. Thank you all. Thank you.